Thanksgiving, some would say, is the biggest American holiday. Some would think it would be Christmas, but most cultures in America celebrate Thanksgiving. In this episode, we're going to talk about how a group of starving pilgrims made a successful harvest, broke bread with Native Americans, and then, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln declared Thanksgiving a national holiday. How did we get from Plymouth Rock to today, celebrating all that it means to be home? Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. In 1620, a band of European settlers washed upon the shores of what would eventually be Plymouth, Massachusetts. Once on dry land, they offered a thanks for safety of passage. Although they thought they would make it because they were divine and were on a mission from God. Now the pilgrims were good people and they meant well. And they came here from a spirit of good place. And they were certainly brave to truck across the Atlantic. And they knew God would be there to protect them. Although, it seems like this first winter, he was preoccupied with something else. The Plymouth Pilgrims were totally unprepared for the harsh winter. And if you've ever lived in New England during the wintertime, it is impressive. The seeds they brought from home didn't take to the soil. It was said that husbands buried wives one month and then children the next, while fever and malnutrition swept through the village. By the end of that first winter, there was only 52 pilgrims left that arrived on the Mayflower from its original 102. Fifty had passed away. At this point, they were hopeless. And then, in their minds, they saw another sign from God. A Native American walked into the middle of their village and said hello in perfect English. And he introduced himself as Squanto. And Squanto knew how to survive in New England. He knew what to plant there. Squash, corn, and beans, using the leaves of the squash to protect the roots of the corn, to keep the roots moist, and knew how to keep the weeds down. Him and his people shared this information with the pilgrims, who were essentially inept. I don't know if it was in their best interest in hindsight to help these strangers. Perhaps the best interest of the Native Americans would have been to let them die. But after the first winter and the following summer, that fall, the pilgrims had a successful crop of squash, pumpkins, and corn. Governor Bradford declared a festival to celebrate the astonishing harvest. Now, these settlers considered Christmas a pagan holiday and would refuse to celebrate it. But the only holiday they did celebrate was the English Harvest Festival, known as Harvest Home. Now, Harvest Home in Europe would genuinely be a bunch of farmers getting together with the best of their crops at the local church and giving providence. Then there was the second secular aspect of it, which was an all-out party with mandolins and people drinking jugs of wine and dancing in the shit-filled streets of Europe, just feasting, music, and dancing. Sometime during the fall of 1621, the new settlers, also known as the Pilgrims, invited the Native Americans to celebrate the new with a feast. They were bringing the tradition of Harvest Home to the new world. King Massasoit, leader of the local Wakanomak tribe, brought 90 men 
for a three-day festival of games, music, and consumption of spirits. The end of the three days, there was a feast prepared by the only five surviving pilgrim women. And this is the meal we call the first Thanksgiving. We all associate Thanksgiving with turkey, succulent, juicy, roasted turkey, which was also at the first Thanksgiving was goose, codfish, and lobster. Venison was also on the menu, courtesy of the Native American guests. What wasn't at the first Thanksgiving was pies, for they did not have the ability to make ovens, and with their sugar supplies running low, there was probably no cranberry sauce. Another thing that was missing from the first Thanksgiving was forks, because the pilgrims thought this was too lavish and excessive for their life. And they made do with knives, spoons, their fingers, and of course, their love of God. This 1621 harvest mill was really about thanks of good fortune and celebrating the kindness of friends and family. America in the 1600s later was viewed as the land of bounty. And soon people would forget about the hardship of the pilgrim. And each fall, a official day of Thanksgiving was declared by each colony's governor to celebrate a bountiful harvest and to praise God. Since midweek prayer fell on a Thursday, it was natural that they would have this day of thanks on Thursday. And from this humble beginning of a day of thanks, turned into the stuff to the gills and thankful we're with our families, known as Thanksgiving. And every year, the governor would claim a menu. You never knew which day it was going to be. It was just around the second or third week of November, sometimes late November, when people anticipated when it was going to be, women would be busy baking pies in anticipation for the celebration. And even though pies and plum pudding were traditionally served back in Europe to celebrate Christmas, well, the Puritans outlawed Christmas. They wanted to have these traditions and transferred them to the new day of thanks. By the 1690s, food was overtaking prayer of Thanksgiving. And religious leaders at the time were upset about this, thinking that Thanksgiving should be spent in the church, on your knees, and maybe even fasting. Now, what would Thanksgiving be without eating? In 1777, George Washington declared a national Thanksgiving, which was really, by national I mean all 13 colonies, to celebrate the victory of the Battle of Saratoga, and signed into the law the next 200 years, public officials could declare a Thanksgiving any time there was a major achievement. Benjamin Franklin, inventor of the bifocals, discoverer of electricity, and part writer of the Declaration of Independence, was a big advocate for the turkey to be America's national bird. In his opinion, the bald eagle was a scavenger, was a thief, conniving, while the turkey was stoic and showed honor. Now, it is also said that turkeys will drown if it's raining and they look up with their mouth open. At this point, Thanksgiving is still mostly a New England holiday. As the colonies expanded and children moved away from home, every fall, children and grandchildren would return to New England to celebrate this meal. And although the turkey didn't become our national bird, it is America's favorite bird to eat as well as the centerpiece of every Thanksgiving. To show how this was a family event, it took the whole family to prepare the meal. Imagine seeding the raisins to make a mince pie, or splitting the wood to get the hearth nice and hot to roast your turkey. The idea a manifest destiny swept the colonies and pushed 1.5 million New Englanders Western, 
to places like Missouri and Louisiana. They carried along with them Thanksgiving. In 1850, St. Paul, Minnesota only had 227 houses, but the three local hotels threw a Thanksgiving feast for traveling settlers and locals where they served buffalo, bear, and venison. In 1849, New England missionaries who were living in Hawaii, spreading the word of God, threw a celebration to show thanks to King Kamehameha for his hospitality. This was a Thanksgiving that was more like a traditional luau. This was to show cross-culture accommodations. By the mid-19th century, most states celebrated Thanksgiving, but when they were declared, varied by weeks or sometimes months, declaring it a national holiday was campaigned by a woman who did more for Thanksgiving than the turkey, Sarah Jessica Pale. She was the editor for Godey's Ladies Book, the most popular magazine from the 19th century. This book had everything from recipes, sewing tips, politics, and architecture. All got equal treatment in the magazine. And every November issue of this magazine, Sarah would encourage all women in America to throw a traditional style New England Thanksgiving. She would say what kind of linens to use, what kind of tablecloths, what kind of dishes, and what to make. Around this time, abolition was splitting our country in two. And Sarah was concerned that there would be a North and South. She saw Thanksgiving as a way to unite the country where everyone could agree. She ended every magazine with a plea to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. She even wrote every governor, including southern governors, to help declare Thanksgiving as the last Thursday in every November. Southern states refused to celebrate, but in 1863, Abraham Lincoln declared that the last Thursday in November would be Thanksgiving. This was four months after the Battle of Gettysburg, and Sarah finally gotten her wish. With the Civil War over, Thanksgiving was on its way to being America's holiday. By the end of the 19th century, America was wealthy. The wild wilderness that the pilgrims settled produced bounty and made America one of the richest countries in the world. So Victorian Americans had much to be thankful for. In America, celebrated with typical nouveau riche style. For example, women of the household would write out the menu in French, even if it was very bad French. Going through the courses, such as appetizers, salads, and soups, all the way to the pumpkin pie. In the rise of the industrial age, things like tablecloths and silverware were much more affordable for the working class, so even modest households could celebrate a proper Thanksgiving, which this means there's finally enough chairs for everyone at the table, there's a piano in the parlor for people to gather at after dinner, Victorian households had a resurgence in religious community, and reflected and admired the early Puritans for how they celebrated Thanksgiving in the pious sense. They wanted to uphold this tradition, but one major problem was there was no Native Americans to be found to sit at the table. In the mid-1800, America was still at war with tribes out west, and Victorian art at the time depicted the first Thanksgiving as more of a standoff than a friendly celebration. Now, we talked about America's middle class, the underside of the Gilded Age, was a world of sweatshops, 
as street orphans. Now, these unfortunates would not be forgotten on Thanksgiving. Society women, especially ones who wanted to do the right thing, or Elise who wanted to make the right impression. In New England, they would pass out firewood and turkeys to the less fortunate. Society women would also invite street children to celebrate and have a five-course meal. Sometimes this would be the only full meal they would have that year. As we shift into the 20th century, Thanksgiving makes the shift from giving to receiving. By receiving, I mean football, of course. Football is quickly becoming America's favorite pastime and the focus the fall. In the early part of the 20th century, people still work six days a week, often 12-hour days, and Thanksgiving was a whole day off. And what people wanted to do on their day off was go and watch a football game. In the 1920s, there were several national football teams. A lot of them were struggling to find a fan base and a niche. The struggling Detroit Lions developed a Thanksgiving Day game, offering something for people to do on this day off. And if you're from America, you see Detroit play every Thanksgiving. It's the only time I know that Detroit Lions exist. In New York, another tradition was taking hold. The New York Ragged Muffin Thanksgiving Parade, where young men would dress in costume and take to the streets. These events were chronicled in the New York Times and published nationally. Thanksgiving parades would become a national event in most major cities. Eventually, department stores would take notice of this and start sponsoring these events and use it as the kickoff of the Christmas season to let people be aware of their stores. In 1924, the first Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was held. The next year, churches protested it because more people were going to the parade than were going to church. Every year, I tried to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And lately, with all the weird Broadway stuff that snuck in in the last 15 years, it is almost unpalatable for me. But just like Alice's Restaurant, it is tradition, and I will continue to do this. But luckily, Thanksgiving stands against the commercialization such as Christmas. You can't really buy something other than food on Thanksgiving. But as soon as the clock strikes midnight, that all changes. And the reason for that change is because of the 1930s Depression. The economy was weak in America. Manufacturing jobs are down. Production is down. We have a massive transient population. And one way to stimulate the economy was to expand the Christmas shopping season. So in 1939, President Roosevelt decided to move Thanksgiving up a week allowing a week longer for Christmas shopping. And of course, this became a political issue. Democrat states changed the date, while Republican states refused and kept it the same. In protest, some small businesses were putting signs in their window saying, do your shopping now. Who knows? Tomorrow may be Christmas. Just three years later, Congress decided once and for all that Thanksgiving would be the fourth Thursday of November. In the 1940s, America entered World War II, and men and women serving overseas longed for the totem of home. And it was guaranteed that everyone serving on Thanksgiving Day would be given a turkey meal. American soldiers often invited local kids from war-torn regions in Europe 
to share in their Thanksgiving meal. Around this time, Norman Rockwell painted The Freedom of Want in the New York Post, which I would describe as a nostalgic painting, one that is also unattainable. Since the first Thanksgiving, it has been politicized in some form of another. And I'm not just talking about the politics discussed at the table, which I'm sure would be plenty this year. Since the 1940s, every president has pardoned a turkey on Thanksgiving to show respect to animal lovers. But politics could also be serious, such to the Wampanoag people in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where Thanksgiving symbolizes the beginning of the end, as where some Americans view it as a day of thanks. Some Native Americans view it as a day of mourning. But for most Americans, Thanksgiving is not about Plymouth Rock, pilgrims, politics. It's about home and going home to the holidays. Thanksgiving, that's an American holiday. Canada, you celebrate Thanksgiving on the wrong day, but you celebrate it. And Canada, what are you thankful for? That you border America. That's it. That's all you got. Germany, you don't celebrate Thanksgiving. It's because you got nothing to be thankful for. Always try to remember that. We celebrate it because we're such a narcissistic country. We need a holiday to force us to say thank you once a year. Because normally we do not say thank you. We say, you're welcome a lot. Often after another country did not say thank you. They usually said, ouch, cut it out, stop it. And we're like, you're welcome. Why do we have turkey on Thanksgiving? Does anyone know? Why do we have turkey on Thanksgiving? Are you completely uneducated? (laughs) Nobody knows. It's okay if you don't know. The government doesn't want you to know the truth. The real reason we have turkey on Thanksgiving is because just 80 years ago, this entire country was enslaved by turkeys. And it was not until we invented the baster that we were able to rise up and conquer the evil turkey. That's why today on Thanksgiving, not only do we kill and eat a turkey, we stuff shit up its ass to humiliate the turkey and send the message that it never happens again. I teach American history part-time online at Axe Body Spray University. You guys should definitely take one of my courses. All right. I'm going to just tell you some Thanksgiving facts. Did you know that the Swans Company developed the TV dinner after an excess of turkey after miscalculating how much they would sell on the holiday? They pre-roasted the turkey and paired it with other foods, and then packaged it in a tray that could be easily heated. As a result, helping single men and weekend fathers celebrate the holiday. Because nothing says Thanksgiving like a TV dinner. What are we having this year? Besides disappointment, another fun fact or misfact is tryptophan making you feel sleepy. Yes, tryptophan, when it is isolated and put into capsule forms, will make a tired effect. But the amount that is found in the dark meat of birds is not enough to make you feel the results of this drug. The amount of birds you would have to eat, I believe, is around eight. The reason after dinner you are most likely tired is because of the couple glasses of wine the preparing all day, possibly the traveling, and then eating more than you are used to. And speaking of traveling, people associate the day before Thanksgiving as the busiest travel day of the year. This is incorrect. It doesn't even rank in the top 20. Usually, the busiest travel day of the year is the third week of July, and it's on a Friday. Another fact, even though I covered it earlier in the episode, is Thanksgiving is not just an American holiday. It stems from Harvest Home, originated in Europe. Another fun fact is the bird is called turkey because Europeans love the bird so much, they brought it back to Europe via 
Turkish merchants, therefore naming the bird turkeys. Besides America being the number one consumer of turkeys in the world, the number one consumer per capita is Israel. Another fun fact is most Americans like leftovers more than the first meal. The average American consumes 229 grams of fat on Thanksgiving Day. About 46 million turkeys are consumed by Americans the fourth Thursday of November. Butterball alone receives 100,000 calls each season for orders. And finally, Black Friday is the busiest day of the year for plumbers. Not because the toilets are backed up, like I would initially thought when I read it, but because people overwork their garbage disposal. All right, meatheads, that's going to do it for this special Thanksgiving episode of The Meat Block. And I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to contact us, you could email us at themeatblockpodcast at gmail.com or reach us on Instagram at themeatblock or tweet us at themeatblockpod. We also have a Facebook page, The Meat Block. And I encourage people to go over there, sign up, tag a friend, get people to go over there. We got great conversations happening over there and we want to continue to see it grow. And if you want to contact us individually, you could contact Ryan at Gather and Break on Instagram. You can contact David at A Farm Butcher on Instagram. You can contact myself at American Butcher on Instagram and Facebook. And if you're looking for ways to support the show, the best way to do that is to tag us on social media. Yes, social media, that thing you use every day. Just like at Iverstein's Farm on Instagram or Rise and Bloody Shine on Instagram as well. So tag a friend or use the hashtag the Meat Block or the Meat Block Podcast and we would be greatly appreciative. Also, the number one way to support us is to open up the Apple Podcast app, type in the Meat Block, head to the review area and leave a five-star review and leave a comment. I can't urge you to do this enough. It would mean the world to me. Perhaps take a screenshot of it and send it to me at American Butcher on Instagram. Now, finally, I'm going to end the show by playing Alice's Restaurant in its entirety. So I hope you enjoy it. It is a Thanksgiving tradition in my household, one I could remember listening to for pretty much my entire life on the holiday. So remember, keep your knives sharp, live in the margin, and keep all your fingers. This song is called Alice's Restaurant. It's about Alice and the restaurant. But Alice's Restaurant is not the name of the restaurant. That's just the name of the song. And that's why I call the song Alice's Restaurant. You can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. You can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Walk right in, it's around the back, just a half a mile from the railroad track. And you can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Now it all started two Thanksgivings ago, it was on two years ago on Thanksgiving when my friend and I went up to visit Alice at the restaurant, but Alice doesn't live in the restaurant, she lives in the church nearby the restaurant in the bell tower with her husband Ray and Fotch is a dog, and living in the bell tower like that, they got a lot of room downstairs where the pews used to be, and 
Having all that room, seeing as how they took out all the pews, they decided that they didn't have to take out their garbage for a long time. We got up there, we found all the garbage in there, and we decided it'd be a friendly gesture for us to take the garbage down to the city dump. So we took the half a ton of garbage, put it in the back of a red VW microbus, took shovels and rakes and implements of destruction, and headed on toward the city dump. Well, we got there, and there's a big sign and a chain across the dump saying closed on Thanksgiving. And we had never heard of a dump closed on Thanksgiving before. And with tears in our eyes, we drove off into the sunset looking for another place to put the garbage. We didn't find one. Till we came to a side road, and off the side of the side road was another 15-foot cliff. And at the bottom of the cliff was another pile of garbage. And... We decided that one big pile is better than two little piles, and rather than bring that one up, we decided to throw ours down. That's what we did. Drove back to the church, had a Thanksgiving dinner that couldn't be beat, went to sleep and didn't get up until the next morning when we got a phone call from Officer Obi. He said, kid, we found your name on an envelope at the bottom of a half a ton of garbage, and wanted to know if you had any information about it. And I said, yes, sir, Officer Obey, cannot tell a lie. I put that envelope under that garbage. <laughs> After speaking over for about 45 minutes on the telephone, we finally arrived at the truth of the matter and said that we had to go down and pick up the garbage and also had to go down and speak to him at the police officer station. So we got in the red VW microbus with the shovels and rakes and implements of destruction headed on toward the police officer station. Now, friends, there was only one or two things that Obi could have done at the police station and the first was that he could have given us a medal for being so brave and honest on the telephone, which wasn't very likely and we didn't expect it. Another thing was that he could have bawled us out and told us never to be seen driving garbage around the vicinity again, which is what we expected. But when we got to the police officer station, there was a third possibility that we hadn't even counted upon, and we was both immediately arrested, handcuffed. And I said, Obi, I don't think I can pick up the garbage with these handcuffs on. He said, shut up, kid. Get in the back of the patrol car, and that's what we did. We sat in the back of the patrol car and drove to the, quote, scene of the crime, unquote. I want to tell you about the town of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where this happened here. They got three stop signs, two police officers, and one police car. But when we got to the scene of the crime, there was five police officers and three police cars being the biggest crime of the last 50 years, and everybody wanted to get in a newspaper story about it. And they was using up all kinds of cop equipment that they had hanging around the police officer station. They was taking plaster, tire track, footprints, dog smelling prints. And they took 27 8 by 10 colored glossy photographs with circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one explaining what each one was to be used as evidence against us. They took pictures of the approach, the getaway, the northwest corner, the southwest corner, and that's not to mention the aerial photography. After the ordeal, we went back to the jail. Obi said he was gonna put us in the cell. Said, kid, I'm gonna put you in the cell. I want your wallet and your belt. And I said, Obi, I can understand you want my wallet so I don't have any money to spend in the cell, but what do you want my belt for? And it said, kid, we don't want any hangings. Said, Obi, did you think I was gonna hang myself for littering? Obi said he was making sure, and friends Obi was, cause he took out the toilet seat so I couldn't hit myself over the head and drown. And he took out the toilet paper so I couldn't bend the bars, roll out the roll of the toilet paper out the window, slide down the roll and have an escape. Obi was making sure, and it was about four or five hours later that Alice, remember Alice? It's a song about Alice. Alice came by and with a few nasty words to Obi on the side, bailed us out of jail. We went back to the church, had another Thanksgiving dinner that couldn't be beat and didn't get up until the next morning when we all had to go to court. We walked in, sat down. Obi came in with a 27 8 by 10 colored glossy pictures with the circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back. Each one sat down. 
Man came in, said, all rise. We all stood up, and Obi stood up with the 27 8 by 10 covered glossy pictures. And the judge walked in, sat down with the C&I dog, and he sat down. We sat down. Obi looked at the C&I dog. And then the 27 8 by 10 covered glossy pictures with the circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one. And looked at the C&I dog. And then the 27, 8 by 10 colored glossy pictures with the circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one and began to cry because Obi became to the realization that it was a typical case of American blind justice and there wasn't nothing he could do about it. And the judge wasn't going to look at the 27, 8 by 10 colored glossy pictures with the circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one explaining what each one was to be used as evidence against us. And we was fined fifty dollars and had to pick up the garbage in the snow, but that's not what I came to tell you about. Came to talk about the draft. We got a building down New York City, it's called Whitehall Street, where you walk in and you get injected, inspected, detected, infected, neglected, and selected. I went down to get my physical examination one day and I walked in, I sat down, got good and drunk the night before, so I looked and felt my best when I went in that morning. Cause I wanted to look like the all-American kid from New York City. Man, I wanted, I wanted to feel like the all I wanted to be the all-American kid from New York. And I walked in, sat down, I was hung down, brung down, hung up and all kinds of mean, nasty, ugly things. And I walked in, I sat down, they gave me a piece of paper, said, kid, see the psychiatrist, room 604. And I went up there, I said, shrink, I want to kill. <laughs> I mean, I want, I want to kill, kill. I want, I want to see, I want to see blood and gore and guts and veins in my teeth. Eat dead, burnt bodies. I mean, kill, 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 kill. And I started jumping up and down, yelling, kill, kill. And it started jumping up and down with me, and we was both jumping up and down, yelling, kill, kill. Sergeant came over, pinned the metal on the set me down the hall, said, you're our boy. <laughs> you feel too good about it. Huh? Proceeded on down the hall, getting more injections, inspections, detections, neglections, and all kinds of stuff that they were doing to me at the thing there. And I was there for two hours, three hours, four hours. I was there for a long time, going through all kinds of mean, nasty, ugly things, and I just having a tough time there and they was inspecting, injecting every single part of me and they wasn't leaving no part untouched. Proceeded through and I went finally came to see the very last man. I walked in, walked in, sat down after a whole big thing there and I walked up and said, what do you want? He said, kid, we only got one question. Have you ever been arrested? And I proceeded to tell him the story of Alice's Restaurant, Massacre, with full orchestration and five-part harmony and stuff like that. And then all the phenomena stopped me right there and said, Kid, did you ever go to court? And I proceeded to tell him the story of the 27 8 by 10 colored glossy pictures with the circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one that stopped me right there and said, Kid... I want you to go over and sit down on that bench that says Group W. Now, kid! And I, I walked over to, to the bench there, and there's, there's Group W is where, the, where they put you. If you may not be moral enough to, to join the army, after committing your special crime, and there was all kinds of mean, nasty, ugly looking people on the bench there. There's mother rapers, father stabbers, father rapers, 
father away from sitting right there on the bench next to me and one he was mean and nasty and ugly and horrible and crying fighting guys are sitting there on the bench and the meanest ugliest nastiest one the meanest father raper of them all was coming over to me and he was mean and ugly and nasty and horrible and all kinds of things and he sat down next to me and said kid what'd you get I said I didn't get nothing I had to pay fifty dollars and pick up the garbage he <laughs> said what were you arrested for kid and I said littering and they all moved away from me on the bench there to carry I bone all kinds of mean nasty things till I said and creating a nuisance and they all came back shook my hand and we had a great time on the bench talking about crime mother stem father rape and all kinds of groovy things that we was talking about on the bench and everything was fine we were smoking cigarettes and all kinds of things until the sergeant came over had some paper in his hand, held it up and said, Kids, this piece of paper's got 47 words, 37 cents, it's 58 words. We want no details of crime, time, crime, and else kind of thing. You got to say, turn to the back, crime, one of the rest, not sure, name, and else kind of thing. You got to say in the top for 45 minutes, and nobody understood a word that he said. But we had fun filling out the forms and playing with the pencils on the bench there. I filled out the massacre with the four-part harmony and wrote it down there just like it was and everything was fine and I put down a pencil and I turned over the piece of paper and and there there on the other side in the middle of the other side away from everything else on the other side in parentheses capital letters quotated read the following words kid you rehabilitated yourself I went over to the sergeant and said sergeant you've got a lot of damn gall to ask me if I've rehabilitated myself I mean I mean I mean, I just, I'm sitting here on the bench. I mean, I'm sitting here on the group W bench. Cause you wanna know if I'm moral enough to join an army, burn women, kids, houses, and villages after being a litter bug. <laughs> he looked at me and said, Kid, you don't like your kind. And we're gonna send your fingerprints off to Washington and friends. Somewhere in Washington, enshrined in some little folders, a study in black and white of my fingerprints. And the only reason I'm singing you the song now is because you may know somebody in a similar situation. Or you may be in a similar situation, and if you're in a situation like that, there's only one thing you can do is walk into the shrink wherever you are. Just walk in, say shrink. You can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant and walk out. You know, if one person, just one person does it, they may think he's really sick and they won't take him. And if two people, two people do it in harmony, they think they're both faggots and it won't take either of them. And if three people do it, three, can you imagine three people walking in, singing a bar, Alice's restaurant, and walking out? They may think it's an organization. And can you, can you imagine 50 people a day? I said 50 people a day walking in, singing a bar, Alice's restaurant, and walking out. And friends, they may think it's a movement. And that's what it is. The Alice's Restaurant Anti-Massacre Movement. And all you gotta do to join is to sing it the next time it comes around on the guitar. With feeling. So we'll wait till it comes around on the guitar here. Sing it when you does. Here it comes. You can get anything you want 
at Alice's Restaurant. You can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Walk right in, it's around the back, just a half a mile from the railroad track. And you can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. That was horrible. One end war and stuff, you gotta sing loud. You could put a lot. I've been singing this song now for 25 minutes. I could sing it for another 25 minutes. I'm not proud <laughs> or tired. So we'll wait till it comes around again. And this time with four part harmony in the feeling. We're just waiting for it to come around is what we're doing. All right now. You can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant. Accepting Alice. You can get anything you want. At Alice's restaurant, they walk right in, it's around the back, and just a half a mile from the railroad track, and you can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant. Da 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 da. At Alice's.